But we're truly thankful that God has brought us down to this present moment of time. Thankful that He's still on the saving throne. That whomsoever will, let Him come and drink of the water of life freely. Eat of the bread of life freely. Follow the light that is in this world, which is Christ Jesus today. There's no other name. The Bible tells us in Acts 4 and 12, none other name given among men under heaven whereby that we must be saved. And if there ever is a time that we need to proclaim that, and I'm not just saying you all particularly, but everyone that breathes the name of Christ and knows about saving power, it's in this day in which that we live. We have uh, thought upon our heart out of the first, um, the book of First Kings, and in the 19th chapter, if you have your Bible with you, turn there with us to First Kings chapter 19. Now this book, we know, there's been debate about who wrote it, what time frame he wrote it in. The main thing is that he wrote it, whoever that it was. And this concerns itself with a wide variety of things. <clears throat> First of all, the death of David. And then we find scripture in there about the life of Solomon and also the building of the temple, the temple of God. Death of Solomon. And then after Solomon's death, the split of the kingdom into two separate kingdoms. And this is where that the end was starting before that they went into captivity. Ten tribes went to the north. There were two to the south. Up in the north, they began to worship idols. They were able to stave it off down in the southern kingdom, Judah and Benjamin. But soon after that, the ten tribes were taken away into captivity by the Assyrians. Later, the kingdoms of Judah and Benjamin were taken by Babylon. And that's what we're teaching on in uh, Daniel. Daniel was one of the cap captives that was taken into Babylon. And there, God used him. In spite of the fact he was captive, God used him. What we're about to read today is uh, many years before that that took, all took place. There was still two kingdoms. One was in idolatry. And there came upon the scene a man that we would probably deem as being very peculiar, very uh, different, very strange. He was a prophet. And he lived a solitary life. And whenever that God would speak to him and God would move him, he would go oftentimes with a message to the king. In this instance, unto Ahab. And we find in the 18th chapter, and I'll get to this 19th chapter soon, but in the 18th chapter, he called the challenge unto Israel. And he said these words. He said, why halt you between two opinions? If Jehovah, Yahweh, be God, then serve Him. If Baal be God, serve Him. Nobody answered a question. And you know the rest of the, the account, how that they built an altar, the priest of Baal, and they begged and pleaded with Baal to send fire down from heaven to consume their sacrifice. Elijah did the same thing. And he did something a little bit different. He poured water all around the sacrifice, the trench around it. And then he began to pray and he said something to the effect that they may know that there is a God in Israel. Fire came down from heaven, consumed the sacrifice, licked up all the water around about the altar. And the people fell immediately because they recognized the power of Jehovah God. So what we're going to read is on the tail end of what all that happened. And if you have your Bible, again, we invite you to read along with us. 
Ahab, the king of Israel at that time, told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. And wherewithal he had slain the, all the prophets with a sword. And then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and he went for his life and came to Beersheba. Now, he went all the way from the north down to the south into the land of Judah. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, even beyond that. And he requested for himself, and get this, he requested for himself that he might die. Have you ever felt that way? At times, Lord, they've torn down your altars. They no longer honor you in our nation's capital the way that you are deserving of. We see sin on every hand. And sometimes you wonder, Lord, it's coming to an end anyway. Why should I worry about it? Why should I even be concerned about it? And as he laid and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake, bacon on the coals, and a cruise of water at his head, and he did eat and drink, and laid him down again. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time, touched him, and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. And he arose, and he did eat and drink, and went in the strength of that, get this, for about 40 days and 40 nights unto Horeb, the mount of God. This is the same mount that God called Moses up into when he received the law of God. And while he was there, he came thither unto a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said unto him, What doest there, Elijah? I've had God say that to me several times. What are you doing, Paul? What are you doing here? Is this what I called you for? Now, I'm not talking about being pastor of this church. I'm talking about sometimes just, boy, Send somebody else, Lord. And he said, I've been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, slain thy prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, Go forth, stand upon the mount before the Lord, and behold, the Lord passed by. And a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And then after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. Now this is what we want to come down to, this 12th verse. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire... A still, small voice that spoke to Elijah. I'm reminded of what it says over in Zechariah that it's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by my spirit, thus saith the Lord God. He had won a great victory over Baal. 450 priests that were sacrificing unto Baal. If you read anything about Baal worship in that day and in that, that time, it was the most hideous, idolatrous, cruel type of worship that could be because they would sacrifice their children. They wouldn't sacrifice a lamb or a bullock or anything like that. But they would sacrifice many times a child, their own baby. And that had been brought into the land of Israel through the queen that Ahab had, Jezebel. You know, I'm, I'm amazed at that name and 
I'm, I've noticed, you know, do you ever watch babies' names and, and look at uh, what they're called? Nobody calls their child Jezebel anymore. I think and nobody calls their child Adolf. And nobody calls their son Caesar. You know, it's, it's got a name anymore that leaves kind of a reproach. But Baal worship had been brought in and Elijah had questioned them and asked them, why in the world you, worship, you try to worship God, but then you're over here worshiping Baal? And he said, what is wrong? And he said, you're halt between two opinions. So we find that, you know, the rest of the story, how that Elijah called down the fire from heaven to consume his sacrifice that he had offered, and God made his presence known. It was a mighty thing. It's something that the children of Israel did not forget on that day, or at least for that time being. Later, he would pray that the drought would end. They had had a drought for about three years and six months. The rains would not come. Heaven had been short over. And Elijah had prayed for that by God's direction. But then he prayed that it might rain again. And rain came. And rain drenched the earth there. And it showed once again the power of God. Do you know, sometimes we believe, and I'm not just pointing at you, but sometimes all of God's children will believe if it's something really spectacular that happens. If God would just roll back heaven and show his great and mighty power while well, he's been doing it through nature, through occurrences in the, in the natures and, and in the heavens. He, from time to time, will heal an individual whenever that there's no hope so that the miracles are there. But what do we follow today? Well, let's look at what Elijah did. After that, he heard that the queen was going to come for him and she was going to make his life like the life of those 450 priests of Baal whom Elijah slew. Elijah took off and left. And I would imagine I would have done the same thing if it had been left up to me. But you know, the Bible tells us that he fled into the wilderness. He came down to Beersheba in Judah. Then he went a little bit further into the wilderness. And it's interesting how that God was kind of directing that because he was getting closer and closer to Sinai where God was going to reveal something to him. He laid down underneath a juniper tree. I'm not sure what a juniper tree is, but it might have been pretty inviting seeing that he laid down underneath it. And soon an angel of the Lord came. Do I believe in angels? Yes, I do. Do I think that sometimes angels walk among us? Yes, I do. And maybe we don't have the sight to see them, but I want you to know that they're there. And I want you to know that oftentimes they're around about us, and sometimes they're even fighting in a great conflict against the fallen angels, the ancient agents of Satan, as he moves upon this world and influences this world. The angel nudged him, woke him up. There was a cake upon the fire and a cruise of oil. Elijah got up. He ate it. He drank it. Then he laid back down. Boy, that, that's great to take a snooze after, after having a meal. And especially whenever they probably had not eaten in a long time. But he laid back down. He began to sleep again. And here comes the angel. And the angel nudges him again, and there's another cake and another cruise of water there upon the fire. And the angel tells him, Elijah, arise and eat, for the journey that you're going to go on is great. Now, he didn't go back up into Judah. He didn't even go back up into Israel. But somehow God directed his footsteps to go to Mount Sinai under Mount Horeb. Excuse me, just a second. Under Mount Horeb. 
where Moses had received the law. <clears throat> Where later on the Apostle Paul would go to after that he had been saved to try to reconcile the law of God and the grace of God. Forty has a significant number in the scripture. And I've been told that it's one of the most common numbers that you will find in the scripture. Forty days Jesus fasted. We find tonight, uh, today that uh, 40 days and 40 nights uh, you know, is found throughout the scriptures. But he too went on the strength of that for about 40 days and 40 nights. Now, he could have gotten there in a very short period of time. But the Bible tells us it was a journey of about 40 days and 40 nights, 40 years. The children of Israel wandered in the wilderness. And I kind of wonder, did Elijah wonder in the wilderness, wonder, Lord, what have you called me unto? What have you given me over to do? What messages that you've given to me that has endangered my life? And they're still not listening. Lord, maybe if maybe if together, Lord, we, we just show them. We'll just call down fire once again. But you know, when he got to the cave and he stood in the mouth of the cave, God visited him and he manifested great things. First of all, it was a wind that had rent the mountains. As Elijah stood in that cave, God did that. God is still in control of his creation. God can still take uh, whatever that he wants to and he can change it. People get really upset when they see or hear about a volcano out in the South Pacific that's God's business there, why he's doing it. You know, one time we got out in the, my, my folks and I got out in the yard of our home and we were stargazing. People had claimed they saw UFOs and things like that. But we were out there stargazing and we saw one that, that was about the size of what a star would be. And I remember that we were watching that as it kind of slowly moved along. We didn't think of it as being a UFO. I thought of it because I thought I was real smart <laughs> as a planet or a star. And I remember saying, you know, that, that doesn't happen very often. You know, what's going on? I remember my mom saying, if God wants to play checkers or chess with his creation, that's his business. Oh, mama, let, let's bring science and let's bring rationality into this. And she said, son, God can do whatever he wants to do. And he doesn't have to ask our permission to do it because it's his realm. I'm going to tell you something today. May we get back to that place to where that we honor and that we reverence and that, my friend, we extol him as being God and still God over everything. He's got it in hand. And then next there was an earthquake that rent the rocks. God is still dealing in his uh, creation. He's still dealing with things and moving them and changing them whatever way that he wants to. He's God and there is none other beside him today. There was fire. And I'm not sure what that fire was like, if it was a fireball or what, or a mountain caught on fire. But the scripture tells us something really interesting. God was not speaking in those things that Elijah saw. Though Elijah understood that God had brought them to pass, God was not speaking to Elijah out of them. Because Elijah could have taken those signs as, okay, we'll go back to Jezebel and Ahab and we'll evoke uh, mountains to rent and we'll have an earthquake and we'll have fire. But whenever that God spoke unto Elijah, what he spoke to him in was a still, small voice. We look sometimes for God to speak to us in a, in a way that's just supernatural. And, and I believe God does it, and I believe He can do it. But sometimes He wants to speak to us in a still small voice and to get our attention. And you know, oftentimes it's so faint that 
for me, I've got to sit down, I've got to turn off the internet, the TV, everything else, and sit and listen to what that still small voice is saying. Because I want you to know God's voice doesn't just come and go and come and go, just like God's Spirit doesn't come and go and come and go in services and so on and so forth. And I want you to know He is always speaking. He is always. If we'll just listen, we'll hear Him. I gotta, I've got to turn off the Internet. Oh, man, I'll tell you lately, I've just had to bury the phone. And even then... Surely hides it from me, hides the computer from me, because I'm going to get on the Internet, onto the news stations, and then I go and try to sneak off and log into hers. <laughs> Let me tell you something today. It's a lesson I always have to learn. God is in control. Can you say God is in control? God is in control. And he's got this thing going just the way that he does. And I'm always worried about Israel. I want to tell you, I worry about them. I'm concerned for them and the hatred around the world. But, you know, there's some scripture that says whenever that you see the nations surround Israel, God is going to step in. So I just have to take that and say, Lord, you've got it under control. How does He speak to us? He speaks to us in a still, small voice. In a still, small voice. What does He say to us? Sometimes He says to us, I love you. I just want you to be reassured that I'm here for you and I'm going to uh, be with you to the end. Other times, He'll lead us to some verse of Scripture. That's why it's so important to study the Word of God today, because this is what God oftentimes animates. And whenever that He speaks, it's also a measuring tool that we can know that it is of God, and it's not of something else, or it's not of Satan, or it's not something from memory. But, my friend, that it is is the voice of God. It will always go in line with the Scriptures. Did you know that today? Why, God spoke these worlds into existence by His Word. Then He gave His Word unto uh, others to write down, to pin down. I've gone to, to see museums where the, the great links that they go went through to write down the Bible, to write down, and even sometimes to hide it. And it's come down to us at this very moment, at this very uh, hour. It's come down to us. Us. And he didn't just give it to us so that, you know, we might have something to carry into church with us. He wants us to study it. He wants us to read it. He wants us to be assured of it. Because many times when God speaks to me, and this is just the way he deals with me, whenever that he speaks to me, he'll animate some scripture that comes to mind that maybe I read years ago. But here it is. God pops it up before me. And someone will probably say today, well, preacher, you're... That's kind of odd. Well, I know. But that's how the God, the God deals with me. And there'll be some scripture. And whenever... I can tell you this much. When I start to go astray, whenever that I start to looking at brothers and sisters in Christ or other things, and I begin to murmur and to complain... Just as sure as anything, there'll be a scripture that will come to mind that will remind me, that will remind me how in James it says that the tongue is set on fire of hell. Boy, that got my attention one day. Brother, I want you to know that he may not answer in a great, great and mighty way that he has before in earthquakes and in fires and in winds. But if he ever does, then glory to God. I'm thankful that he's still able to do that. One time the disciples were gathered with, the, with Jesus and he was going to go down to Jerusalem. He set his face steadfastly like he was going to go to Jerusalem. They were up in Samaria. 
And as they were up in Samaria, he sent them into the villages of Samaria to take the gospel unto them. But the people wouldn't receive it for some reason. They wouldn't heed to it. They wouldn't even give it a second thought. And so the disciples came back and said to him, Lord, they're not hearing us. Boy, there have been times whenever that preaching on the radio or whatever, you don't get any response. I said, Lord, you know, fine. Judgment come upon them. No. No. The disciples came back to Jesus and they said, Shall we call fire down upon those Samaritans because that they did not hear us? Shall we call it down upon them and consume them like Elijah did? Jesus said, you don't know what spirit you are. The Son of Man has not come to destroy lives, but to save lives today. And this gospel is in his hands today. And we find today that still small voice will be backed up by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will accompany it. You know, some, some people feel like the Holy Spirit comes and goes and comes and goes and comes and goes. And the manifestation of Him, yes, and, and the feeling that we get. But you know, He said, I'll dwell within you forever. You know, whenever that we're saved, His Spirit takes up abode within us. And we can be so familiar with that that whenever that we hear him speak to us in a still small voice, we don't have to even wonder what it is that he's trying to say to us. Yes, I would love to call fire down, but that's not the way God does things in this day and age in which that we live. What does he want? He wants the gospel. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And he said to every creature, he said to every nation, to all that you can get them to hear you, go into all the world, preach repentance towards God. as what Paul told uh, the, uh, the Ephesian elders at Ephesus. He said, well, you know, I preach nothing but repentance towards God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what God wants us to preach to a lost and dying world today. He's going to take care of the end. He's going to take care of all the rest of us. All we have to do is be in our place before Him. Where that if somebody comes along and needs the Lord or needs, needs help or needs comfort or assurance, whether it's sorrow over a death or whatever the case might be, I'll leave this with you. One day there was an evangelist by the name of Philip that was up in Samaria. And he, there was a great revival up in that area. It's in the book of Acts. And as he was uh, there, God spoke to him. And he said to him in a still small voice, he said, go down into a desert that I'll designate unto you. And he said, and you wait. Now, how many of us would go out into the middle of a field if God told us to on our way home, whether it's Bolivar or up north, and stand there in that field until God told us what he wants us to do? I know I would probably drive around it a lot. And, Are you sure, Lord? Are you really sure? But Philip went down there, and he was in that desert. And as he was in that desert, up over a sand dune perhaps, there come a big procession from Ethiopia heading back home. And there was a man inside of that chariot that was reading out of the book of Isaiah where that it talked about in prophecy about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he was reading it out loud and he was pouring his heart out over it, trying to understand it. And Philip heard him and he said, do you understand what you're reading? And this man said, no, how can I except some man guide me? 
We can guide people up to the foot of the cross and Jesus can take over. And that's what Philip did. And as Philip began to look at that scripture and he began to open his mouth and preach Jesus, that man went, something happened in that chariot. That man went all the way, all the way from not knowing one end to the other about what he was reading or who it was about or that he had come to where that they came up to a pool of water and he said, well, here is water. Philip, what does hinder me from being baptized? Now, how can a person know that? It's because of a change in their heart and because of the message and the still small voice that spoke to him that spoke to that Ethiopian eunuch. And Philip told him, he said, if you have been saved, I'm just kind of paraphrasing, if you have been saved, if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, if you uh, understand, if you, you feel in your heart that He is the Savior, thou mayest. And he said, I believe with all of my heart. Now, I know that may not sound like much of a testimony, but I want you to know that's what a testimony of salvation comes down to. An encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. An encounter with Him. Where that He becomes Savior. Where that He washes us in His blood. Where that He makes us anew. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And so in front of that group, here goes Philip and the eunuch down into that pool. Can you imagine what those soldiers thought whenever that they saw that? Can you imagine how they feared? They thought, perhaps, oh gosh, how are we going to explain this to Queen Candace? How are we going to explain all this to her? That didn't matter. They both went down into the water. Philip dipped him, brought him back up. And the Bible said he went rejoicing on his way because not only did he understand now, that still small voice spoke to his heart and to his soul. So as we close our few remarks this morning, God speaks to the lost many times in a still small voice pleading with them, come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And then he speaks unto us as God's people, directing us, leading us, guiding us. And I want to tell you something right now, and you get tired of hearing this, I know. I'm so thankful I stand before a blood-washed congregation. I thank God that I stand before people today that when you talk about salvation, when you talk about born again, they know exactly what you're talking about. They know exactly what you're talking about. We may all phrase it a little bit differently, but boy, whenever that it comes right down to it, what is salvation? It's peace with God. A still, small voice that speaks and says, I am yours and you are mine.